So a uh, really warm welcome to everybody. I already had a lovely journey here and um, I was reminded on the way that it's Magga Puja Day today, which is um, the second most important Buddhist festival. Um, the first one, if any of you know anything about um, Buddhism and its festivals, is Vesak, which is the celebration of the Buddha's enlightenment. And Magga Puja today is the celebration of the coming together of 1,250 enlightened monks and nuns with the Buddha. So it's actually a celebration of Sangha and the fourfold assembly. So all of us here and our potential for awakening. And I thought that was a very beautiful kind of um, thing to draw to everyone's attention first, because the practice of compassion is about our own awakening, but it's also very much related to um, to promoting the harmony and well-being of all beings. If we're only after enlightenment, if we're only after knowledge, it can get a little bit dry. But the Buddha was known also as the great compassionate one. So he was known mainly for his wisdom, but a result of that wisdom and outcome was his compassionate heart. And his teaching stemmed from the understanding that all beings are subject to suffering in some form or another. It's inevitable and inescapable fact of life. And so he taught out of compassion, out of Anukampa, for the happiness and well-being of all. And just the other day, I actually, um, sometimes I go on Facebook because I have to promote uh, the project that I'm doing, out of compassion, of course, not out of any sort of distraction. But sometimes I get a bit distracted, I have to be honest. Um, and this time I saw a little post and it said, define Buddhism in one word. So I thought to myself, and the word that came to me was compassion. And then I saw the, another answer by a senior monk, and he said, well, awakening, because Buddha means awake. And then I, I read another post by a Mahayana um, monastic, and they said, compassion. So then I realized I'm actually Mahayana. But that's only a little joke, because actually anyone practicing the Eightfold Path is practicing all of that, and you can't really separate any of it. You know, the first factor of the path is right view, and this connects us to the suffering that we all experience and the fact that it's very impersonal, much more than we'd believe. And from that stems the wish. In fact, it's the only reasonable response to live a compassionate life. So the first place uh, that the compassion of the Buddha is really um, represented in, is in his formulation of and his teaching of the Eightfold Noble Path. This is is his compassionate way of bringing us out of suffering. You know, every step on that path is designed to lessen suffering and bring about more happiness, not only for others, but not only for ourselves, right? But also for others. And it has to include both. You know, any action that's truly beneficial, truly wholesome, has to serve others as well as ourselves. Otherwise, it can't really be the Dhamma. So compassion is included in the right motivation for practice, the second factor of the path. And there it's described as the intention of non-harm or non-cruelty. So it's described in its negative aspect. But you could also see that in the positive aspect of gentleness, compassion, harmlessness. Yeah, I think gentleness is a beautiful attitude because compassion is the antidote to cruelty. And sometimes we don't think we're cruel but we're not gentle with ourselves. We're not gentle with our bodies or minds. And that is a kind of cruelty. We're forcing, we're pushing ourselves, you know, we're trying to kind of pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, as they say, and, you know, strive to gain and improve. This is not really understanding the purpose of the path and the gentleness that's required to allow the Dhamma to unfold. So it starts off in the right intention to practice and I think having a motivation of compassion immediately gets us on track to avoid the pitfalls of say spiritual materialism or a kind of narcissistic spirituality that's aimed only on our feel-good vibe, <laughs> right? And so in that sense compassion is quite a mature quality of heart. Um, whereas metta as a Brahma Vihara is defined as a mother's love for her only child, but extended to all beings. So it says, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, so with a boundless heart, we should generate or develop loving kindness to all living beings. Compassion is more connected with suffering. So it's that same mother's love, 
but directed towards a child who's sick, a child who's in distress, you know, a child who is feeling sad. And so that love becomes, it's also benevolent, it's also all encompassing, but it's particularly focused on that being, that child's freedom from suffering. And that's what makes compassion beautiful and joyful and uplifting for the heart. Because these states of the Brahma Viharas are very pleasant states. So we offer you know, ourselves, we offer others a kind of sympathy, a nurturing kindness, a warmth, a sort of loving tender care that attempts not only to wish but also to act to alleviate the distress of ourselves and others as well. So, but it does require and it fosters a spiritual maturity that doesn't shy away from suffering but learns how to turn towards it with kindness again and gentleness um, so that we can meet the suffering and also learn how to respond appropriately in a way that really does bring genuine relief. <clears throat> so this requires a lot of courage. It's unpleasant to turn towards suffering and most of our lives we're conditioned to turn away, right? It's almost a knee-jerk response. Something hurts, don't want to see it, want to put something over it, slap on some, I don't know, music or even meta meditation. Sometimes we do it just to change an unpleasant feeling, but that's not the motivation of compassion because it's from that um, understanding of suffering that compassion is informed in a sense. Um, and we find an appropriate response. Yeah? If we're too scared to meet the suffering in ourselves, it's hard to hold space for others. But when we're able to uh, meet that wisely and hold space for ourselves, then we can also be there for others. And another difficulty that I'm sure will come up today, especially when we discuss uh, about the topic together later on, is um, that compassion can be often perceived as quite a difficult practice because it does bring up some suffering and sometimes some overwhelm. Yeah? Sometimes uh, we feel so strongly um, with another or for another that we sink into what's actually called empathetic distress. So we start to grieve with that person, we start to kind of feel swamped, it's too much. And then again, we have that reaction of either pulling away, turning away, or just kind of numbing out, right? Or, of course, being dragged down too. <laughs> so how can we understand and cultivate compassion as the Buddha taught, as a quality that frees the heart? And also, how can we develop it in a balanced and universal way, even for the perpetrators of harm and even for ourselves, right? <laughs> we also perpetrate harm towards ourselves and others all the time. And that sometimes requires coming in contact with our own capacity for cruelty, which we have and we have to be realistic about, right? So long as we have greed, hatred and delusion, so long as we're not clear about where our happiness really lies or the happiness of others really lies, then we will sometimes act from um, in unskillful ways. And we have to have forgiveness for ourselves. So this morning then, I wanted to talk about how my journey of compassion began. And I think for me, it began with embodiment, you know, getting to know, getting a sense of my emotional world, um, including the sadness and the grief, and getting to know it without judgment, right? Because I think in my teens, I'd felt a lot of distress, a lot of depression, actually, which probably many teens go through. The hormones are involved, you know, you're having questions about the meaning of life. You're being asked what you want to do for the rest of your life when you don't even know yourself. And it sometimes feels too much, you know, and then you've got exams right on top of that and all the stress that comes with that. And so, you know, I felt kind of I felt as though there wasn't really anyone who understood because there was nothing external much to point to. It's like everyone goes through it, so why should I be suffering, right? Um, but when I learned to practice, I learned to embody those feelings and that grief in a much more universal way, realizing this was part of life and this was actually something that could connect me to others in a way that helped open my heart. And I learned not to judge that. I learned to just 
hold this warm and tender space for whatever would arise. And through that, I could understand its impermanent nature. So we had to learn, and it's a process, right, of, to gently lean in to our emotional world um, and listen deeply to what our bodies and our minds and our emotions are telling us because they're there for a reason, they arise from a cause. And then compassion adds a sense of care. It's the inner voice, and it doesn't have to be verbal, but it's the intention of, um, okay, tell me more. I want to understand. How can I care? Yeah. And sometimes when compassion is expressed to us, it is like a friend who says, you know, I understand, I know. I don't know, but for me, that's so reassuring. You know, if somebody says, I've been there, I know. Right? But then do we really have to know a person's suffering to have compassion? Because that is actually quite hard. And I think in my experience, empathy certainly helps. Like empathy is a part of compassion. You know, it's that um, ability to tune in to how a person might feel, to put ourselves in their place, in their shoes. And, you know, I've been through things in my life that have given me more appreciation for other people's struggles that are similar to that. And certainly it helps, you know, this is why we have support groups, right? This is why we have like grief and loss groups or we have Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a wonderful example of a compassionate, caring, nurturing group to help bring people out of addiction. Yet if compassion remains limited only to those we understand, it's also, uh, it can't be universal in its reach. So sometimes I think it involves a sense of humility to say, you know, I don't, fully understand but let me know more i want to learn i want to understand what you're going through yeah and this of course might be difficult for us uh, but it's important to have that sense of vulnerability and uh, humility that we don't know everything we want to care we want to listen and we can do that with ourselves as well right I just want to say a caveat here, um, because I was thinking about this earlier in relation to, say, people from marginalized communities. There are many people here today from different backgrounds, different skin colors, different genders and, and sexuality, sexual orientation. Um, yeah, there's one bikini <laughs> and there's lay people. So we're quite a mixed group. And sometimes we can't expect people from marginalized communities to do that work for us. You know, if we say, well, tell me how it feels to be discriminated or marginalized, that can be quite triggering and that can be really exhausting for those who live with this all the time. So I think sometimes compassion also manifests in um, a motivation that um, encourages us to to learn. You know, we can do our research, we can do our reading, we can um, listen to other people's testimonies, we, we can find out ways to start relating to people who may seem different from us without necessarily unnecessarily burdening them. And again, I wanted to um, mention, I guess, one of the shadow sides of empathy. And one of my friends said this to me recently. She said, uh, isn't empathy feeling what another person feels? And I thought about that. And I thought, actually, no. It's impossible to feel what another person feels. We might think we are, but actually what we're feeling is our response to the way that person makes us feel, right? We're feeling what we feel around that person. So I think it's important to have proper emotional boundaries. And uh, I was saying to someone this morning, actually, for me, a boundary doesn't mean a fence. It doesn't mean a wall. It more means, and I mean, this is an exploration for me. This was an idea that came up to me on the tube today. <laughs> it was a very nice journey. Um, but I thought, yeah, for me, emotional boundaries is something like staying embodied and taking responsibility for my emotional response in the presence of another person, right? So this person feels what they feel. I feel what I feel in response. But they're not responsible for that. And if I can stay embodied, then I have a clear sense of, you know, a place where I can help from. 
I'm not just falling into a kind of um, resonance that's pulling me in with them, but it connects. It connects, but there's a little bit of space. So we need to have that space. And um, sometimes that can mean a bit of self-compassion, which is around knowing where your limits are, right? Sometimes we can sit with another person and hold that space for a while. And the more we're able to hold it for our own emotions, the more we're able to hold it for another. But still, after a while, we might need some time out. We might need to um, develop self-compassion practices. And we'll talk more about that today. But an example of this actually was um, on the retreat I was teaching at Gaia House, just um, finished two days ago. Uh, I haven't had a lot of space between the two retreats. Um, and during that retreat, one of the coordinators came up to me and said, uh, one of the retreatants, um, kind of like foster mothers, has just passed away and I'm going to have to tell the retreatant this. And they felt quite, I could see they felt quite agitated and, and obviously, understandably, a bit nervous about having to do that, right? And uh, I said, well, is there anything I can do to help? Would you like me to be there? And they were like, I can do it. And I could tell they were uncomfortable and that um, discomfort might be a bit unsettling for the retreatant. So I said, it's okay, I can come. And the reason I could say that was because I've held that kind of space for my own grief before. And I was confident that I could sit there with a lot of uh, openness and hopefully welcome that person's feelings, you know, hopefully hold space without um, too much emotional reactivity on my part. So I went down and I uh, broke this news and the lady burst into tears, but it was just a beautiful, soft, open space that allowed for that. And she didn't say much, but she started opening up a little bit. And, uh, and I said, you know, if we want to meet tomorrow, we can. And we did, we opened up again. And again, I was holding space because she um, was worried that the grief might somehow be damaging to her health or, you know, maybe she would roll in it. And I used the example of um, responding to our inner grief, the way we'd respond to a child, like a, our own child, right? And this woman was a mother. Um, you know, if that little child came with kind of a tear-stained face and messy hair and maybe someone said something unkind to them or, you know, they just lost, they just had an argument with their friend, we'd open our arms, right, and we'd embrace them, we'd take them in with warmth and with a reassurance and a gentleness. And um, she said, wow, actually, I can't believe you've used that example. I came here hoping to learn how to mother my inner child. And... She still wasn't sure. I said, just take it gently. You know, you can leave at any time, even if it means halfway through a meditation. But uh, she stayed the next day and then said, I'm just so happy and grateful that I did. You know, because that was such a deep learning, I think, for her, as it can be for all of us, that we don't need to stigmatize our emotions. You know, she was worried about crying in front of everyone. I said, don't worry, a lot of people will be, and we're all in our own world, but we're together. We're holding this beautiful, warm space that allows for us to go through what we need to. Um, so this is something that can come from our own ability to contact our emotional world with that kindness and warmth and lack of stigmatization. And also um, just being learning to be more gentle, learning to be more spacious and... Um, and give things time, you know, give our emotions time to arise, to, to meet us, to get to know us or we get to know them and uh, to teach us as well. And something I often um, remind myself of when uh, I'm going through a difficult time is that I know that distress, that suffering is not going to be in vain if I can relate to it kindly, because that's going to help me connect with others who've been through similar things. You know, it's just going to increase the compassion in the end. You know, even the ability to talk about these things, right? So much of the time in society, we have to kind of put on a brave face and talk about things in a positive way, also in spiritual circles, right? But the Buddha said suffering is real, it's there, and it's to be understood. 
And for me, that is such an enormous relief. You know, and I think another aspect of um, the compassion, I've kind of talked a bit about connection, but also perspective. And again, that's informed by right view, the fact that um, the feelings we go through as human beings are universal. And we also have this universal desire for happiness, right? We have this universal desire for, um, for pleasure, for finding a path, for finding real meaning in our lives. But unfortunately, because, you know, the causes of suffering are still there in our hearts, we have greed, hatred and delusion in various degrees, you know, and they surface at various times. We will make mistakes and we will misdirect that search for happiness in ways that causes harm to others. Yeah, mic's OK. So um, I think for me, this can help me have more compassion to other people when I see that they're just trying to be happy. And maybe they don't understand quite how. Maybe I don't always understand how, right? Maybe I work too hard or I get stressed about silly little things like whether the um, guests at the monastery have done the washing up and put things away. <laughs> you know, we can become a little bit too close to um, the details in our lives. But that perspective, you know, understanding that um, we're all struggling with um, putting in the causes for our happiness and so often making mistakes that really, you know, we can be a bit more forgiving with ourselves and other people. So just to go back again into this um, aspect of connection, connecting to suffering, connecting with each other, which I think is such an important part and benefit of compassion. I was uh, thinking this morning about how I think what most people really long for in their hearts is loving connection. You know, we yearn for this. And especially in more um, capitalistic kind of societies where we've, uh, the big wider family structure has broken down. Um, many of us, I don't know about you, but I kind of talk to my neighbors when they might have a parcel for me, but apart from that, I don't really know who they are. You know, and, and for me, when I was 19, I went to Asia and I did have a sense almost of sadness and longing when I saw that people there, although they had so much less materially, had this sense of community. They had this sense of belonging to something bigger, extended families, you know, societies that had similar shared values. Um, you don't have to like text somebody first before you arrange a phone call. You don't even need the phone call. You just walk through the door, right? <laughs> in the villages in Asia, in say India or Burma, the doors open. You know, in Burma, because it's a Buddhist country, people come out of their door with their rice and they serve the monastic community on Pindapat when you go for alms. And monastic life is a beautiful example of that. Um, we have this symbiotic relationship between the monastics and the lay community, whereby really the purpose for this, one of the big purposes is so that the Dhamma is spread, right? So that the lay community can receive teachings but also to give the lay community the possibility and uh, opportunity to um, inspire themselves and to perform acts of generosity that have meaning for them. And as well, it keeps the monastics very honest because if you are a scallywag, then hopefully, ideally, the, uh, the lay community will figure that out and they won't feed you. <laughs> okay, so don't judge us too hard because then none of us will be fed. We, should, we don't have to be enlightened, right, in order to deserve the food that's hopefully going to help us get enlightened. But, um, you know, hopefully it keeps monastics virtuous and open to scrutiny. You know, they have to, um, they have to be very honest about where they're at. And I think that's such a beautiful system because it includes the whole of society. It's not only the fourfold assembly, right? men, women, lay people, men, women, sangha. It's also um, transgender people. It's also gender non-binary people. It was basically an umbrella term that included everybody. And it was a very decentralized um, system. There was no kind of head monastery where, sort of like the Vatican, where the head monastery tells all the other ones what to do. You made decisions as a community based on the particular context that you were living in. And it was actually very democratic. So even though people would be um, kind of have 
more of a voice if they'd been in the robes for longer. It only depended on their going forth. It didn't depend on their former lifestyle or livelihood or whether they were from the Brahmin caste or the lower castes. Basically, it was only, um, you were senior in terms of your going forth, not in terms of your age or anything else, not even in terms of the gender, despite popular belief. <laughs> So it would be wonderful if we could create communities on similar lines and we could really be there for each other in the ways that play into our strengths because we all have something to contribute and not one person can provide, you know, everything to anyone. Sometimes this can be a cause for overwhelm when we see the troubles in the world and we think, well, where do I even begin? <laughs> you know, do I work at the level of activism or do I kind of give money to the this particular charity or do I join Doctors Without Borders and go overseas or you know what can I actually do and we can all do something we can't none of us can do everything right and I think to rejoice in that and to see the beauty in the way that you are able to alleviate the suffering for someone somewhere and also for yourself right this is really important part of the path so as usual, I have lots to say, but uh, I still have 10 minutes to talk about what compassion has looked like in my life, what it's felt like in my life, and how we can practice compassion in our meditation today. And you'll have your own stories, which I'm hoping you'll share later on. But for me, I guess I am someone who learns from example, and I, I learn best from compassion when I do see it embodied and manifested in another. And um, one of the best examples in my life is my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, who has no doubt very deep uh, meditation experience, but uh, also as my teacher has guided me through so many challenges and um, helped me on the path. And I think, you know, this is the highest thing we can actually do. The Buddha says the greatest compassion is to show someone else the path to real freedom from suffering. Um, as far as we can. But uh, one of the things I've noticed with my teacher, which is extraordinary and differs from others, is that no matter how I present, whether I'm in a state of um, anxiety or um, doubt about you know, my monastic life and the difficulties I encounter, he's able to hold that space without worrying about me. I don't know if that um, resonates for anyone here, but one thing I've noticed with most people who are a little bit too close and who maybe have more vested interests, for example, parents or close friends, if we go to them in, you know, with some grief, we end up feeling we have to protect them <laughs> because they start to worry about us and say, oh, you know, this is making me feel really bad and what can I do? And, you know, maybe they go into fixing mode. But if, no matter how upset I am, if I go to my teacher, he'll just look at me and say, I'm not worried about you. <laughs> and I remember once thinking, but you should be. <laughs> what do you mean you're not worried? Can't you see I'm suffering, you know? I'm coming to you to show you how much I'm suffering. Um, but then he, said, he looked at me and he said, you have my trust and respect. And I just thought, wow, can't he see I'm a wreck? And I have his trust and respect. He's seeing something much deeper. He's seeing beyond those emotional storms. And he's seeing my potential for awakening and, and really feeding that. And that is something so beautiful, you know. It, it's a solid, it's a, it is an ability to hold space, you know. He's not flinching, he's not turning away. But he's also not getting um, pulled down. There's been other times that I've been sick and I've gone to my teacher as, we do in monastic life, they're also um, uh, a teacher or a preceptor has the responsibility to take care of our uh, physical needs. So last year in the monastery, I was suffering with my chronic condition, which had a big flare up and uh, nothing seemed to work. And it just struck me how many times he would ask in such detail for my exact requirements down to particular herbs and spices, particular vegetables, particular things that he could perhaps ask the kitchen to arrange. You know, and it really was a feeling of like, anything I can do, anything I can do, I'm here to help. And I think that's so lovely because it shows that compassion can be very specific, you know, and um, 
really taking care to do whatever we can, but without expectation and without even requiring that that person gets better. It's not an attempt to fix, right? Do you ever feel fixed? You go to somebody and they try to tell you what to do or how to be or how you should have behaved, or they just want to kind of, you know, make you feel better so that they don't have to feel that discomfort of sitting around you when you're in pain. And that feels bad, doesn't it? It feels like there's something wrong with me. It reinforces that sense. But when another person can just say, I'm here for you and, you know, I trust you, I respect you, um, how can I help? Then for me, that's a beautiful compassion. There's a sense of warmth in that. There's also a sense of sacrificing something, right? What can I do to give? There's a generosity. There's a concern, but there's also, it doesn't remain sentimental. There's an actual effort to alleviate one's suffering, one's distress, and even one's physical sickness. Another thing I've noticed from my teachers and also good friends is, again, that aspect of non-judgment, but also patience. You know, they give you time to grow. It's not like at the end of this retreat, I'll be expecting you all to have loads of compassion and you've overcome all your resentment to, I shouldn't say it, but I'm going to say anyway, Donald Trump <laughs> or whoever, you know, you might love Donald Trump and he's, you might think, well, he's not in our country. Phew. But uh, <laughs> we're going to have resentment. We're going to have like feelings of helplessness sometimes that arise when we see the troubles in the world. And that's okay. You know, this is a process and it's a commitment. Another thing my teacher once said to me is that I'm committed to being kind to you. It really means no matter what, right? And also I'm around for you. I'm always around. So again, that sense of spaciousness, that sense of allowing things to take time. It's a process. It's a training. Thank goodness, right? The Buddha said compassion is something that can be trained. And I try to train it on myself in self-compassion, which is what I want us to practice now, because the more compassion we can have for ourselves, again, the easier it is for that compassion to uh, flow over in a healthy way to help others. So sometimes I am exhausted, you know, sometimes I am feeling uh, like the, the job of trying to establish something for women in a country where that hasn't actually happened yet and where most of the male sangha anyway have taken a decision against full ordination for women that is a really tough job and sometimes I get tired you know and I think gosh maybe I'm not up to the job but then I remember that that empathy can be towards myself too and sometimes we can say to ourselves you know wow you're feeling this way there's no wonder that it'd be completely natural to feel like this in your situation you know anyone would feel this way and as soon as I hear those words, you know, for myself, it's like such a relief. Sometimes I'm wanting someone else to say it for me, but they don't. <laughs> but we can ask ourselves what we'd really need to hear. And we can say that to ourselves, you know, in a really loving, tender way. Recognizing again that common humanity that we share, that anyone would be struggling in our shoes, right? I think another thing I've learned over the years and also in this role is to ask for help. And luckily I have some volunteers. Some of you are here today, you know who you are. And uh, you encourage me to ask you for help, which is wonderful. And whenever I do, I'm surprised. You know, I'm surprised at how other people really want to feel valuable. They want to feel um, that they can contribute in a meaningful way. You know, every one of us suffers the impoverishment of isolation. We suffer from feeling um, alone and we want to be part of something bigger than ourselves. So asking another person for help involves vulnerability, right? It involves a bit of courage, but more than not, that vulnerability has always been met with love. And I think vulnerability can allow the love in. So again, this is a very tender, quality and i'm not saying just open yourself up to the whole world you know all at once but a little bit at a time you know it's like um a child who's trying to learn to swim they don't just go and plunge into the ocean right they first go to the paddling pool and maybe holding the mummy or the daddy's hand they <laughs> put their toe in just to check the temperature of the water and when that feels okay maybe they put both feet in and splash about a bit then 
maybe go out, you know, with the mummy again or the dad. And then bit by bit, they get that confidence to go up to the knees, right? They have their rubber armbands on or whatever. And, uh, and bit by bit, they go in. Eventually, once that water feels good to them and once they realize, oh, actually, it's quite freeing to, to let go and to allow the water to just, you know, wash around the limbs. And eventually, they actually learn to float. And only years later, right, they might learn to go into the uh, bigger pools and then the oceans to swim. So bit by bit, we have to be very gentle with ourselves. I think another thing, I mean, part of this self-kindness and self-compassion that's very popular, um, especially in the sort of capitalistic uh, world of adverts and, you know, <laughs> materialism, is uh, self-care right? Kind of being good to ourselves, having a hot bath, etc. You know, taking time off. And that's all okay, as long as we understand we're doing that for the purpose of um, enabling ourselves to grow spiritually, not just pampering the body, not just feeling good, but putting ourselves in the right mindset and, you know, having enough sleep so that we are able to serve our societies, our communities, look after our families, etc. And also give ourselves opportunities to grow in the Dhamma. So that's already obviously a sign of self-compassion in each one of you here because you've given yourself today to, to growing in the Dhamma. You know, whether that's a few drops in your jar of good qualities or whether that's, you know, a lot. You've given yourself the opportunity to just percolate in a really nice atmosphere of other people who are on this path, other people who have compassionate, noble intentions to develop their heart. So that's really wonderful. And also, lastly, something I have to do in my role because it's weird, right? Being up at the front and people come and they know you and you don't know them. And it's like, <laughs> it's sometimes really strange. And one thing I've learned out of self-compassion is just to be myself, right? So you'll probably see me being a bit goofy from time to time and giving you a hug if, you're, if I'm allowed to, according to my rules. Um, <laughs> because it's so important just to remember you're a human being like everybody else and to avoid feeling you need to put on an act, you need to put on a shield, because that can really kind of, again, cause that isolation and cause a kind of self-protective shield that doesn't really serve anybody and especially not oneself. So I think it's important to learn to be ourselves. And of course, we might have coping mechanisms. A friend of mine recently um, went through some triggering, you know, for an old trauma and I could see she was slightly disembodied and um, I questioned her about it because at first I didn't know how to respond. It's like, I can't tell how you're feeling, so it's hard for me to relate. And she said, oh, it is a coping mechanism. And as soon as she said that, I had a sense of compassion, you know, that sometimes people need to do that for a short time. But again, even then, we can accept them as they are, right? So, this is a lot. I hope it's not overwhelming, <laughs> first thing on a Saturday morning. But I now do want to get into the practice a little bit and talk about um, how we can practice with self-compassion. So again, embodiment, first of all, just coming in contact with our bodies, and being aware. Yay. Sure. There's a lot more space down at the front if anybody um, wishes to take it up. Don't worry about being close to the teacher. She doesn't bite. <laughs> and I don't have to shout so much if you're closer. So we'll sit and practice now for about 40 minutes. So um, do have a little stretch if you haven't done already. <coughs> Loosen up your limbs and just getting in contact with those areas in your body that might be a little bit tight or tense. For me, it's always the shoulders. <laughs> Too much computer work.
So if you're comfortable to do so, <clears throat> you might wish to close your eyes gently. Some people prefer to keep their gaze lightly cast down. And you'll notice that with your eyes closed, you start to tap into the felt sense of your body sitting. Noticing any sensations that arise. Knowing how you feel. Allowing yourself to land. Perhaps feeling that connection with the earth, your cushion, or with your chair and your feet on the ground, embodied, present, grounded, and also sensing in to the spaciousness in your body and around you. Allowing yourself to take up that space. Perhaps noticing the space above your head The way the skin contacts your clothing or the air around you. And imbuing that spaciousness, that awareness with warmth, with kindness, with tender concern. Checking in with how you feel. And responding, especially to any unpleasant sensation or emotion that's difficult to be with, softening gently. And soothing in a soothing and comforting way. as though your awareness were an expression of kindness. Just soaking that feeling in through your body, allowing it to soak every part of your body from the top of the head through to the tips of your toes, your fingertips.
And if you wish to help you connect with that feeling of self-compassion a little bit more, you might bring up a time that you felt compassion inside, whether towards yourself or another. (coughs) Bringing up that memory, who you were with, where it took place, inside or in nature, outdoors. The sounds around you, the atmosphere, the temperature, Really bringing that situation to life. Sometime you felt a sense of compassion. Doesn't have to be anything major. Just a feeling of warmth, of care. Of tender concern for yourself or another. A sense of I know and I understand. How does that feel in your body? As an emotional tone. Does it have a color? texture, just allowing yourself to bathe in that emotional tone or maybe color that you associate with compassion. Just gently softening and opening into that. However subtle or humble it may seem. Just giving yourself space, holding space gently and kindly for whatever arises in your body or mind. And just see how wide you want your awareness to be. If there's something painful or unpleasant arising, does it feel best to be close to that? Like a friend holding your hand or hugging your inner child? Or is it more easeful to widen your awareness to include those feelings, those emotions that are easier to be with right now? There's no right or wrong here. Whatever eases the pain and brings about a feeling of relaxation and comfort for you.
If it helps for you, perhaps breathing in these feelings of friendship, warmth, comfort. Maybe once again, breathing in that color as though your breath is tinted by the shade of compassion, by the hue. Allowing that breath to soak through your body into any area that needs a little more care. Breathing into your emotional world. Allowing the out breath to completely end. And perhaps noticing if there are any words or phrases that arise in your heart in response to what you're feeling right now. Words of reassurance and care.
And without turning away from your feelings, whilst offering your feelings that tender care, Also recognizing your wish, the beauty, the joy in your wish for freedom from suffering. Connecting to that. In ways that relieve any distress. your own capacity for true happiness, a happiness that hears the cries of the world and responds.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation, just gently checking in with how you feel now. Noticing any changes in your body and your feelings, sensations and your emotional world. Perhaps a slight softening or relaxation. A little bit more kindness and friendliness towards your inner world. Just noticing. Noticing your capacity to be even more kind. The places where you're stuck. Maybe voices of self-criticism, just noticing all of that. And wishing yourself well. May I be kind to myself. Accept myself just as I am. May I be free from suffering. May all beings be free from suffering and its cause. So now we have the opportunity for some fresh air and walking meditation. It's a beautiful day. So um, just to get a sense here for how many of you have not done any walking meditation before. Yeah. A few of you? Okay, great. Thank you. So for those who are less familiar, and even if you are, um, the walking meditation is another posture in which to practice um, and a very helpful posture to continue the continuity uh, of mindfulness and also a very effective way of bringing a little bit more interest in for the mind, something more for the mind to get hold of, if you like. Sometimes when we're sitting, and especially on a Saturday morning after a busy week, we might feel tired. I know that I do. We might feel um, a little bit dull. Um, and the walking meditation is a way to bring a bit more energy to the mind because there's a little bit more to be aware of. And of course, you can do it outside. So the idea with walking meditation is to take a stretch of grass or particular piece of the path, um, probably to stay within the confines of the King Alfred School, 
rather than doing it on the street because you'll look a bit strange. Um, <laughs> and your path has a beginning and an end. And uh, you might want to put, I don't know, a stick or something at the end so it's very clear to you. And we just walk with awareness of the feelings in our feet and also our legs, if you wish. And, uh, and just put our minds in those feelings with care and curiosity. So you'll probably find that you're walking a bit slower than uh, you do in everyday life, but try not to walk so slowly that you start to get tight or tense. Just keep it fairly natural and you might find that as your mind settles with the sensations in your legs, in your feet, that naturally you'll become a little bit more aware of all the different sensations and you'll naturally start to slow down. But it's not a race to see who can go slowest. <laughs> and I would encourage you, since today is about the theme of compassion, to also add that kindness, that gentleness, that care. Um, so that you're meeting those sensations with softness um, and with warmth. And it's also possible in the walking meditation to practice with some phrases of compassion, as some of you may have experimented with already. If you haven't already experimented, you might wish to try. So the best phrases are those that come from your heart in response to how you feel or perhaps in response to how you would like to learn to relate to your body and mind. So phrases such as, may I be free from suffering, or that's more focused on the freedom from suffering. It might be, may I learn to be kind. May I learn to be kind to this experience, or may I learn to care for myself. May I give myself the care that I need. Even I'm here for you. I'm committed to being kind. Whatever it is that arises for you that kind of encapsulates that wish for your own um, to be kind and to care for yourself and also the wish for freedom from suffering. So I'll leave that up to you. Um, and you might just wish to choose a particular phrase or even just a word like kindness or compassion and allow that to resonate in the mind. And over time, when you just repeatedly um, suggest these ideas to your mind, you might start to experience the emotion of compassion a little bit more clearly in an embodied way. So does that make sense? Yeah, I'm hoping it's not too many different ideas at once, but I know we've got people, for, you know, who've been practicing a while and maybe a, a range of experiences. So uh, whatever works for you. And you'll be doing that for about um, half an hour until 12. It's about 20 minute, 25 minutes now. Um, and see if you can really make use of that walking period uh, rather than just seeing it as a break. You will have a long lunch break from 12 till 1.15. And we'll meet in here again at 1.15. So there'll be time to um, walk and then also have your food. If you need to go out for that, there's time for that as well. So. And also you can come in here at any time and meditate. If you wish to uh, curl up, lie down, you can find a corner to do that as well.